my workshop five today. Um, I know it's almost at the end of the series, which is crazy. Uh, but today uh, we'll be integrating everything that we've been learning. Um, we'll start off with the presentation actually from our guest speaker, Michael Cluck from the Master Gardener series. Um, and then we'll be going back, um, students will be sharing um, your summer garden design plans. Uh, just some general announcements. Aggies Grow Veggies, uh, thanks to Stephanie, our media coordinator, has published the first three workshop recordings on our YouTube channel. So um, check out that link. Stephanie, if you want to drop that in the chat box, we can. And, then, and at the end of the workshop, we'll be voting on the logistics for our workshop next week. So have different things that we've been covering, planting versus transplanting. And then we've been also at plant care, right? What do our plants need? Um, today we'll be covering um, insects and beneficials versus non-beneficials with Michael Clark. And um, coming up, we'll be cooking with their harvest too next week. And then today's um, objectives, we want to share this with you. Um, do you all know the de difference between beneficial insects and non-beneficials? Which, how do we employ techniques to attract beneficial insects? And how can we deal with those that end up eating our vegetables before we do? So um, we'll be going over that and, um, and then at the end, we'll be we um, we're excited to hear um, you all share with us your garden um, gate designs. All right, Anka. All right. So before we get started, it would be lovely to sort of get in the mood, and um, I would like you all to share the most beautiful garden that you've ever seen. Something you walked by, maybe something you've seen in a picture. Um, for me, for example, it was um, a, a garden that I saw in Paris, uh, at Versailles. Um, that was very interesting, uh, but maybe it was something that you even saw in a mall. So if you could uh, share with us in, in the chat box where you saw this garden and why it was so pretty, uh, it would be nice to, to get different in, insights on, on what you think is a beautiful garden, right? Like we have this example here. Um, we have all kinds of colors. This looks like it's um, um, a garden in, in the Netherlands, maybe, um, because it's so green um, and they get a lot of uh, precipitation, a lot of rain there. So um, that's one of the reasons um, they have such fantastic lawn, which will probably not be as uh, possible in California. Um, Wow, like Lake Constance. I heard that is absolutely beautiful. Thank you for sharing, Marie. Exposition Park Rose Garden. I don't know where that is, but it sounds uh, it sounds really. Oh, pretty. I think that's is that in LA, Ruby? Oh, I don't know. Yeah, it's beautiful. Wow. Okay, Rose Garden is in Utah. Hmm. I would really like to see that. Fantastic. All right. Well, hopefully our gardens are going to look, uh, or at least part of them, right? We're going to have a veggie garden, but hopefully part of it will uh, have some, some flowers, right? Um, oh, wow. That's wonderful. Yeah, I think uh, having a mix of, of uh, decorative plants and vegetables and fruit is, is the best when it comes to a garden. Yes, that's expert. That's wonderful. Like when you have a lot of colors, it's so relaxing, so energetic sometimes, depending on the, yeah, how you're feeling. Student farm. Okay, I'll have to see that one. <laughs> Maybe Laura can tell us a little bit more about the garden at the student farm. All right. Well, thank you everyone for sharing. Um, yeah, and I think uh, Laura is going to introduce Michael. Yeah, and now we have our guest speaker, Michael. We'll let him take the floor here. Hi, everybody. Um, okay, well, we have a big and interesting topic to go through here, so let me get started. Um, get to, we're, we're gonna talk about insects, which are definitely gonna be there, both the good, the bad, and the ugly. So, um, 
But first, let me say, I think it's really wonderful you're all doing this. I mean, gardening in general, I think, is an activity that, you know, you can have for a lifetime um, and enjoy for a lifetime. But vegetable gardening is something where, you know, you'll be able to grow the most local, healthiest um, vegetables that you're ever going to have and learn a lot in the process just about what our food supply involves. So um, I, I think it's great that you're you're all doing this. So let's talk about insects. Um, we'll be able to, hopefully by the end of this, you'll be able to identify some common beneficial insects uh, and some common insects that damage vegetables. Now, one of the, the beneficial categories, if you will, I'm not gonna talk about at all because we don't really have time, is pollinators. So there's a whole host of pollinators um, in, in our gardens uh, and they're important to encourage, but what we're gonna talk about is insects that actually will predate, if you will, on uh, insects that may be harming your vegetables, eating them before you do. So uh, that's the category we're gonna concentrate on. We're gonna, um, and we'll, so why don't you put into chat while we're doing this, some beneficial insects that you may know of now, have either seen in your garden or someone else's garden or just be able to know about. Um, we're gonna talk about some techniques to encourage beneficial insects um, and, and some common approaches to control harmful insects. This is just something to think about. Insects won't inherit the earth, they own it now. And I think um, we've certainly all had those experiences, both good and bad, of how ubiquitous and important insects are to the ecosystem. Um, so just definitely something to think about. One of the things I want you to think about is how much damage can you tolerate? Because there are will be insects in your garden that are going to do some damage. They are gonna chew or they're gonna suck, they're gonna do who knows what, or they're gonna spread disease. Um, but how much damage can you tolerate? And one of my pet peeves actually is, um, when you walk into the vegetable aisle, if you will, at your local grocery store, just how perfect everything looks. That isn't reality. And think about what's been done to create those perfect vegetables. Large, often it is either spraying a lot of insecticides or it's throwing away a lot of perfectly healthy food um, that people could use and eat um, if we weren't so intolerant of any kind of blemish. So is this, something you would want to eat? I would hope so. And this is a lot of what your gardens are going to look like if you grow them organically. Um, how about that? Um, even that is a healthy leaf that uh, can be eaten if you're willing to kind of look beyond a little bit of the bug spit. Um, you know, so think about it. This is, this is, is also um, just fine in many respects. Hopefully you'll be able to find, have vegetables that are a little more attractive than this, but you never know. Um, one of the things to think about is that many of the um, harmful insects look very similar to what are actually beneficial insects. Now this is two different types of bug. Bug, believe it or not, is an entomology term. Um, and they're characteristic, they'll have this, this triangular shape on their back. They all have sucking mouth parts. They'll have a similar life um, kind of, um, history, if you will, but um, this is a brown marmorated stink bug and that will suck uh, juices out of your vegetables. Um, this is a spine soldier bug, which will suck juices out of other bugs so, or other insects, harmful insects. So this is one we want to encourage. This is one that um, we would want to try to at least minimize the numbers of or do away with. Um, so it's important to be able to identify what some of the, um, the harmful bugs are. This one, most of you probably recognize this lady beetle, which is a beneficial insect. They eat soft bodied insects such as aphids. Um, now here's another spotted beetle though. Is this another type of ladybug? Well, this happens to be a cucumber beetle that will chew on your um, uh, squash plants, squ uh, plants in the, um, cucurbit family, so squash and cucum cucumbers and melons, um, when they certainly do some damage that way. They do most of their damage those if they transmit disease. Um, but so we want to try to eliminate these and encourage these guys. But again, you need to know that they're 
it really is a difference. Um, so one of the ways, uh, tools I want to definitely give you is the, uh, the integrated pest management um, website that is sponsored by the University of California. Um, and just, you know, you can just search for UC integrated pest management or UC IPM and it'll come up. Um, there is a section for home gardens. Um, that's the one you'd want to focus on. Um, Oh, there's a lot of overlap in these different areas, but um, focus on that. Um, yeah, click there, and then you'll pull, pull up a variety of pages. So I'd say just you know go in when you have a little bit of free time and just click around and figure out um, you know how to best utilize this tool. But you can identify pests and and ways to um, to deal with them uh, in the in the best way. So here's what integrated pest management really, um, this is kind of the factors that are considered. One is you'd use the least toxic option. Now they will talk about everything from pretty much, you know, nothing all, all the way up to, um, uh, you know, commercial chemicals, if you will, that you can buy and use. And you can choose how far you wanna go. I mean, I, I definitely encourage people to, stick with organic um, pesticides. And even that, they kill other insects too. They're gonna to be killing the beneficials along with those that you're trying to control. So even there, you wanna use them very judiciously. So go to more toxic options only if necessary and justified and if you choose to do so. Um, sometimes the best thing to do is just pull a plant out that seems to be attacked by too many um, you know, insects. Um, you want to encourage beneficial insects. We'll talk about that. Learn to tolerate some damage. Hand picking is always effective with some uh, at least larger insects. Traps can be used. Organic soaps and oils are still toxic. Um, they're still poison, although they are less toxic generally and less persistent in the environment than most of the chemical um, sprays you could find. Um, but even uh, herbicides and, and fungicides that you may find are also toxic to, to insects, including the beneficials. So we want to use those judiciously as, as well. Um, anybody have any questions so far? Oh, I didn't really look. Nope. Nothing? I, okay. Um, I actually had a question about aphid. About... The like little green bugs, aphids. Okay, aphids we're gonna get to aphids pretty soon. So okay. yeah, hang on to that. And actually, if you put questions in chat, that may be the quickest thing and Borg can read them. And then if, um, anyhow, if, if I can't answer your question, we can you know unmute and, and talk about it, but okay. Um, but yes, we're gonna get to aphids, I hope. Um, some of the good guys, what's this? Anybody recognize this one? All right, that is actually a ladybug larva, and they are much more voracious than even the adults. So we wouldn't want to destroy these or pick them off or any way harm them. Um, so yeah, think about when you were a teenager. Um, you know, and you uh, they're quite voracious in the amount they want to eat. This is the larva of a, I mean, this is the pupa of a of a ladybug. So this will go into that, and then uh, an adult will emerge. So that's their life cycle. And we need to be able to identify the most common and beneficial in all of those. Um, how about this guy? Would you want to meet this guy in a dark alley? Probably not. This is a larva of a lacewing. Same thing, lacewings are predators of soft-bodied insects, uh, but the larva is even more voracious than the adult. There's the adult. So we want to be able to identify both of those if we can. And again, you can use the integrated pest management website to identify beneficial insects as well as the harmful ones. Here are a couple of types of assassin bugs. And so these are bugs, um, true bugs. They predate on other insects. Um, this is what their egg clusters look like. So you want to be able to identify egg clusters. All those of the bugs that are actually harmful are going to look pretty similar. Um, but just realize the egg clusters and then bugs different from 
um, the beetles like ladybugs, which have a larva, actually have a nymph stage. So they look a lot more like the adult than a larva does, like a caterpillar is a larva of a butterfly or a moth. But these look fairly similar. Um, so again, we want to be able to realize that just because it's crawling with six legs, it's not, uh, not going to be harmful to our, to our plants and do the best we can to identify the good ones from the bad ones. And how about this? Now, most of us think that a yellow jacket is not a very welcome guest. Uh, they certainly aren't on a picnic, uh, but uh, they are great predators of, of aphids and, and they will even eat you know, honeybees. So that's not a plus, uh, but they definitely are good predators of a lot of um, harmful insects. So we don't want, they belong in our ecosystem. We don't want to eliminate them if we don't have to. Um, one of the ways to make sure that beneficials hang around in your garden is to plant flowers. Um, and the daisy flowers like this, daisy type flowers, or these, which are now used to be called umbelliferas, but like yarrow, these were the flat, small flower heads. And now it's Apanaceae is the family. Um, but these have pollen that's exposed and open. They're not like specialized closed flowers. So the beneficial insects will actually eat the pollen and the nectar um, if they don't have uh, harmful insects to eat. And that'll keep them hanging around in your garden and also having a water source where they can get some water will help keep them hanging around in your garden. And diversity is really the key. If you can have flowers blooming through the whole year, you're much better off and different kinds of flowers. But again, those um, open daisy flowers and uh, like yarrows with the, any, anything with a um, kind of a simple flower is easier for them to access than, um, than some other flowers. All right, some of the bad guys, how are we doing on time? Or have I? We have, have a few, yeah, two minutes? minutes, yeah. Two minutes, okay, we'll try to go real quick. So one question, um, name a flower or two that you think would be uh, helpful to keeping beneficials in your, in your garden uh, or someone else's garden for that matter. All right, here's aphids. We talked about, the, someone asked about this. There are dozens of types of aphids. They are pernicious. They suck um, the juices of your plants. Um, one of the things about aphids is ants will actually farm them they have a sticky sweet substance, so ants will protect them. So one of the things to do with aphids if you see ants around is control the ants. And that, so because the ants will protect them from the, um, from the beneficial insects such as ladybugs and lacewings. Um, so control the ants. The other thing is just a hard spray of water will knock them off. Um, and once you've knocked them off, for the most part, they're not gonna get back up on the plants. And sometimes a hard spray of water will actually kill them because they are soft bodied. So those are two simple ways to work to control insects or aphids that you don't need to go to um, harmful chemicals. These are squash bugs. Um, again, a harmful bug. This is the nymph stage here. This is what the eggs look like. These guys tend to go to the cucurbits, which is cucumbers, squash, and melons. Um, and oftentimes there really isn't a good way to control them other than hand picking. But if you see the nymph stage, you can maybe control them a lot easier than when you get to adults. So uh, pay attention to what's happening in your garden every day to try to see if there are um, uh, harmful insects populations that are starting to uh, increase. Um, this is what the IPM website says about stink bugs, which is another harmful bug, but as you can see, they're all pretty similar. And picking, eliminate ground covers or weeds in the early spring before the population builds up. Insecticides are generally not recommended in the garden um, and parasites and general predators may contribute to control. But again, if you get on top of it, you have a small garden, hand picking is usually the most effective way to control many of the bugs, in, along with encouraging uh, the beneficials. Um, white cabbage butterflies are um, a uh, harmful insect, not the adult. They just, you know, uh, drink uh, nectar out of flowers. But the larva 
will eat the brassica family. So cabbage, uh, cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower, radishes are in that same family. Uh, turnips are in that family and the larva will eat all of them. Uh, the best control for these is actually a, um, uh, a bacteria called Bacillus thuringiensis or BT. If you, and you can get it either in powdered form or liquid form. Um, and, and that bacteria will attack the uh, digestive system of now all, all, pretty much all larvae like this are all caterpillars. Um, but if you spray it selectively on your brassicas, you will be able to kill the, the larva. And lastly, spider mites. Um, this is a tough one. Um, the best control is basically to allow predatory mites. Um, if, if that doesn't work, spraying them with water, they like hot, dry areas, so spraying them with water can be effective. Or um, sometimes the, the third thing to do is basically just pull out a plant that's, that's infested with spider mites to kind of pull, break down the, or bring down the population that way. Um, but uh, definitely insecticides are not, not recommended because again, you're gonna be killing the predators, which is doing more harm than good. Um, so it's a fascinating topic. We have just barely scratched the surface, but uh, I hope you, you know, at least have some of the concepts of encouraging beneficials, looking, uh, trying to identify the, the insect before you try to control them. Um, and, and realize that we all just need to tolerate a little insect damage because that's really the best thing for the ecosystem. Okay. If there are any questions, um, you can put them into chat um, or we can talk about them um, briefly. Questions? And we didn't get to a couple of these others, but um, same kind of ideas. Any questions, Bora? Not on the chat box. Okay. Yeah, that was a great presentation. Really thorough. I mean, also just thorough, but great uh, brief overview. Uh, thanks for curating all those, especially out of your one hour plus <laughs> presentation. Yeah. Oh, it looks like uh, there's one question. Marie? Yeah, so I was about to, ch uh, to type it, but I'm not that fast. Um, so how do you differentiate spider mites from predatory mites so that I know, well, I know that some of my indoor plants have spider mites. I definitely can recognize spider mites, but how would I know how the predator mites look and maybe where can I get predatory mites? Yeah, they're, they're so um, there are a number of types of predatory mites and I'm trying to, there is a distinguishing characteristic that I'm blanking on, but for all of this, basically, again, you go to the IPM website and, um, or you could just, you know, Google an image, if you will, um, and try to identify the difference between like the, the three spotted predatory mite as opposed to the, the spider mite. And they're all really small. So a hand lens is a really, really important tool to have because you're not gonna be able to tell the difference just looking at them by your eye. You're gonna have to magnify them um, to be able to identify them. Um, yep, right. Yeah, so, um, but, but there definitely is a difference. And again, encouraging or allowing the predatory mites is sometimes the best chance for control. Um, you may not find that on your house plants, though, um, but you're not going to be eating your house plants. So you can kind of go up the toxicity ladder a little bit if you wanted to with, um, you know, house plants that you really wouldn't want to do with vegetables you're going to be eating. Right. Thank you. And also to add on to that, um, so you could differentiate spider mites by um, their name. So spider mites, meaning they, they could actually produce this webbing and your predatory mites won't be able to. And they're, um, the predatory mites are also a little bit bigger so and more mobile. So you're more likely to see your predatory mites moving around. Your spider mites are just going to stay put in, in like very certain spots. Good points. Nice. Well, that 
was great. Thank you so much, Michael. Um, I think for the sake of time, we'll move on, but continue to drop your chat, um, questions in the chat box as Michael will be sticking around for our presentations as well. Um, and we've also placed his email address on the um, slides. So I'm gonna share my screen again. Um, we're gonna um, jump into our presentation. All right, so today we're gonna be um, going over how to design your own garden beds um, or how to design your own summer garden. Uh, wherever you are located, uh, there are many different resources for uh, planning out your garden. And so there are some resources that we will be sharing in this moment. Um, and then we'll also get to see the student garden presentations as well. Some resources to consult in planning your garden are um, online. You can check out your planting zone wherever you are located in the US. Uh, for example, in Sacramento here, um, we are in zone nine. And so you can look um, specific uh, um, gardening and planting information um, specific to your region and your climate. Um, as you can see here, the Sacramento Vegetable Planting Guide um, is a one resource um, that you can consult. And um, that link leads you to this um, page where you can see um, with great visuals um, in a calendar year uh, what you can plant. So um, right now uh, we are in the month of May. And so this is for the summer fall vegetables um, that you can plant. Um, this is more of the cool season vegetables, as you can see with the leafy greens or the root vegetables. But we're gonna go over to um, the next page. Um, this is kind of like what you can plant in the winter and spring um, to harvest more in the spring and summer. And right now we're, um, yeah, if we're looking at the summer uh, or warmer, warmer season vegetables, there are a lot of um, tomato like fruit crops um, and like uh, the eggplants here um, and also, also some um, like cucumbers, corn and beans and melons. Um, but luckily when um, in California, we can plant pretty much year round unlike other um, parts of the world where there might be snow and, um, and, and plants that are frost sensitive cannot be grown uh, or cultivated at that time. So since we're in the a month of May, we can see about here, um, there are certain vegetables that we can um, plant, but um, there are more vegetables that we can um, start to harvest. At, um, and with this, consulting this legend, um, you can see that the triangle is preferred time to seed in a greenhouse. The orange circle is a preferred time to transplant. Um, so it's transplanting seeds, um, seedlings that have already been started. And then this blue box is a preferred time to direct seed or um, plant the seeds in the ground. This is seeding and this is transplanting times. So this is a helpful resource um, if you're starting to think about your garden and what you want to plant in the summer. Uh, maybe you will want to plant tomatoes. Um, well, um, we're just at the end of that time, but you can be planting um, or transplanting, as you can see from these um, images, um, into your garden bed so that you can be harvesting in the next couple of months. Tomatoes can go pretty much uh, for the rest of the year. So yeah, that's one example. Um, If you would like additional planting tips, uh, definitely look online. There are so many resources um, and you can look up some planting, companion plants or plants that do well with each other and um, are mutually beneficial when they're grown together. And for more, more tips and more info, you can read the back of your seed packets. So there's a lot of helpful um, information as in like, um, when should I plant? Um, how much spacing will they need? Um, and how much, how deeply should I plant the seeds? When can I harvest? When will they start sprouting? A lot of helpful details in these um, seed packets, yeah. 
And lastly, just consider uh, questions to consider for yourself. And as you start um, um, watching the student presentations, um, we have three examples to share for you. Uh, but you can consider who am I growing for? Like who will be eating the vegetables that I will be growing? And, then, and that also leads to what do I want to grow? Um, where do I want to plant? Am I going to plant in the ground or in raised beds or a planter boxes? Um, if you ha have tested the soil of your backyard or whichever space you are gr um, growing and make sure there is no lead in the ground or um, heavy um, metal metals, um, then that's a good um, that's good to ensure that you can um, grow your plants, um, grow veggies to eat in a healthy way. Um, or else you can also plant in raised beds or containers um, and make use of the space. Um, but you'll just have to buy your own soil. soil. Um, when should I plant the seeds and transplant seedlings? Um, so like I showed in the resources before, you can start to think about um, and start timing depending on how long plants take um, to germinate or to sprout or to uh, grow um, in their season. And then lastly, how will I take care of my plants? Will you be watering uh, by hand or with uh, drip irrigation? Will you be um, adding, amending the soil with compost or um, other fertilizers? Um, will I get enough sunlight um, in my garden? Or um, if there isn't much sun, well, um, maybe I can plant some shade tolerant plants. Um, there are various ways that you can take care of your plants. So not for how the students um, address these considerations in their um, garden designs that they're sharing out in a bit. So this is my summer garden. And I've got daisies, strawberries, jalapenos, carrots, wild onions, tomatoes, lemon and apple trees, and bell peppers. You can see I've got a little beehive with some bees, some snails, some ladybugs. And then on the side, I really love succulents. So I would love succulents. And I'm currently growing forget-me-nots and roses, because I love roses. That's, that's pretty much it. So this is what we came up with. Um, do you want to go first, Elizabeth, or do you want me to go first? Um, I can go first. Okay. Um, so in the planter boxes, um, we tried to incorporate plants that would be really good, like companion plants, so that they could benefit from one another. Um, and so on the left side, you can see um, also like where we would when we would plant them and then like the how depth like how deep they have to go um so we included that and then yeah and then the labeling is like on the left side the left planter um it has parsley carrots lettuce and tomatoes and then the one above that one it has sunflowers cucumbers oregano and radishes and then the one in the right corner has um, peppers, basil, cilantro, and potatoes. So yeah, and then Cindy, if you want to talk about the other stuff. Yeah, so um, we decided to have some, I mean, we decided to plant the three sisters, which are zucchini squash, green beans, and um, sunflowers. Um, I mean, corn. I mean, sunflowers can grow really tall, so the green beans can sort of, um, sort of help with the height, you know, help the the green beans climb a little. And then the zucchini squash will sort of replenish the soils with more nutrients. So we decided to do those together. And then, um, in order to make the the garden plot more welcoming, we decided to do a, a picnic table and a fruit tree in the background, in the back, so that you, there's some shade and a composting area. And that's mostly it. So we basically planned our garden out based on uh, our love for tomatoes, cucurbits, and flowers. Um, so on the uh, right side, we have um, alternating cherry tomatoes and basil. 
for some delicious, you know, tomato basil combos like uh, pizza and caprese and all that stuff. Um, and then they really wanted to plant cantaloupe. So we have a whole cantaloupe patch at the bottom and then another cucumber patch over in the top corner. So there's going to be a lot of, lot of uh, cucurbits going on. Um, and we have some uh, hot peppers over here. Uh, we wanted to plant bird's eye peppers, like the really, like the small chilies. Um, and then there's a path going in between all these sections so we can get around the garden. And then the path is going to be um, bordered by some lavender and some marigolds. I know that lavender is technically a perennial, but it's just so pretty. So we wanted to have a bunch of different varieties of lavender. Um, and marigolds are good beneficial flowers for the garden. They attract all the good insects uh, that Michael was talking about. And we're gonna transplant sometime, uh, I guess now this month or early June. So yeah, great job for putting all these together, um, especially during a busy time in the quarter. Um, and we're, um, Still not sure how we want to uh, adapt these to the community garden. We could just choose depending on the the favorite one um, so far, but we'll also have to think about feasibility with the community garden plots. Like I would, it would be really cool to have grapes there, you know, like Kudas has or um, fruit trees, but considering the longevity and the feasibility of it, um, what everyone wants. But and in the community garden, that's like the beauty of having, you know, being able to share the workload um, because it is a lot of work gardening. It's not easy. And it's definitely not like, you know, um, not the but most budget friendly way to grow your own food, but it's like doing it together, learning um, learning with one another how to garden and then enjoying that um, the fruit of our labor together. One um, thing I think is really cool from what I've seen at the community garden is like, I've seen people like reuse different things as like trellises and stuff. I know there's like one plot that has like a bunch of like old bike rims as like sort of a little fence or something. And so like, it would be interesting to see like what random parts we can like salvage and reuse as like trellises and mm -hmm. like supports. Yeah, so I actually literally liked um, what Diana was saying. She's super resourceful with um, the milk crates you're saying, right? Um, so I, I think definitely that's a good point, Esperanza, whatever, whatever is resources we have, we can use. Okay. And apparently there are like, um, I think pile, I don't know if there are any right now, but I remember reading something along the lines of like a lot of brands are put in a pile or something. And so like you, reusing those as sort of like supports or dividers too could be cool. What were you saying uh, to use as dividers? I think there's supposedly like a pile where people put like the branches they prune off of trees and stuff. Oh yes, uh huh. And you can use it as mulch. Like mulching also is a great practice just to save water. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, everyone give yourself a round of applause and a good, great job um, just sharing out um, all the things that you have learned and um, learned to apply. Um, and hopefully we'll have, if uh, you'll continue to apply them in your care for your um, plants in your, um, at your homes, but also um, maybe potentially in the summer or like elsewhere, gardening actually in person. I'll send out information about the recipe. So purchase ingredients for the cooking demo coming up. Um, fill out the handout that you all got for the workshop five, um, how can, our garden design um, affect our surrounding environment, insects, all the be it insects, plants, or other people. And then um, I'll be sending out uh, more information about the interview um, schedule for anyone, for all those who are interested in participating in my research study. So stay tuned for that. Yep. Okay. I think that's it.